We're calling this Welcome to the Dark Side because in a lot of times with gaming, people are a little confused about what you know the gaming industry is like. You know, what do we what do we really do in, in the in the game space? And so just to give you a brief overview of, of who who am I, uh, my name is Tony Pagliaco. Pagliaco. <laughs> there will be a quiz at the end of this presentation. So uh, but I'm I'm born in Boston. Uh, I went to Arizona State University, got a degree in computer science. Uh, I worked there for about maybe 10 years in a women's uh, web network called SheKnows.com. Uh, I, I went back to Boston because I thought it'd be great to get back to my roots. Uh, I took a, a director's position with a market research company, discovered I hate snow, I hate black ice, <laughs> and I could have good pizza out in the West Coast. So I went back and I came to Washington where I worked for the last six years for Wizards of the Coast, where I was the senior product manager for Premier Play and Esports. And then uh, about six months ago, I changed positions. I'm now at Boeing, where I head up a team of product managers in the data science and artificial intelligence space, working with Boeing Commercial Air and Boeing Defense and Security. So I got about 18 years in the game. Um, I've seen some good, some bad, some ugly, uh, but a lot of, you know, more good than bad. Uh, I spent, you know, a little chunk of my, of my career. You'll see that little, you know, blip in my resume. That's where I was playing poker and magic professionally full time. So I was traveling the, the U.S. playing magic tournaments. I was going to Vegas for poker tournaments. Um, it, the, if, when people ask about playing professionally, they say, oh, wow, you must be great. If you look at like the NBA, um, I wasn't a LeBron James. I was more like a 10-day contract player. Uh, I, I was good enough to get on the stage, but you know, never, the, never brought home the trophy. So. Uh, but you know, working at Wizards was a great experience. It was good to see things from both sides of the coin because having been so involved with that game for so long, it was great to see how sort of like the, how the sausage was made like, you know, behind the scenes. So for tonight's agenda, we're going to just have a really quick to the point in terms of like, you know, welcome, who am I, here's our agenda, blah, 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 the stuff that usually happens in these presentations. But then we're going to talk about online gaming. We're going to talk about our goals for tonight. We're going to talk about how does product management fit into the equation of gaming? Because gaming companies have a reputation for being the hoodies and the sweatpants, uh, you know, vodka and beer on your desk and things like that. So how do you effectively manage a product in that space? Uh, we're going to talk about getting your foot in the door. If you've ever wanted to be in the gaming industry, how do you get your foot in the door? Uh, but then once the door is open, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to actually get in the door? And then once you're in the door, now you're screwed. What are you going to do? <laughs> but we're going to tie, put a nice pretty bow at the end of it and talk about at the end of the day what your mission is as a product manager in the gaming space. And then we'll take questions if you want. Um, so our goals for tonight. We want to talk about three main points. One, how do you get a, job, a product management job in the gaming industry? Because when you talk about gaming, there is a wide space of games. There's Xbox console games. You've got web-based games. You've got desktop computer games off Steam. Um, you've got uh, mobile games. It goes on and on and on. So how do you get your foot into that space? But because gaming is a different animal entirely, what are going to be the unique challenges that you see in that space? Because I saw stuff at Wizards that I never saw anywhere else. And then when I tell people about it, they're like, huh, really? I'm like, yeah, like, these are some of the challenges we face on a daily basis trying to get games out to 30 million players. That's our player base just in Magic is 30 million. I'm not even counting Dungeons and Dragons. So every little tweak, every little idea, every little mistake you make, 30 million eyes are on it, and it's, it's intense. But we're also going to talk about tips on how to effectively manage the balance between the business, the people who want to make the money, and the developers and the engineering teams that want to make art, that want to make quality. Doesn't mean the business doesn't want to make quality, but they're not going to be happy if they're making, you know, they're going to be happy making $15 million versus two. So, Let's talk about gaming for a second. Who here consider themselves a gamer? Two. That's enough. <laughs> who, but who here has played Xbox? Okay. You're, you're all gamers. You all have inner gamers inside of you. It's okay. It's, we've progressed as a society. It's not, it's not embarrassing to be a gamer anymore, okay? Um, my friend Ben was actually the executive producer for Farmville. <laughs> and yes, it definitely counts. 
If you have clicked on an imaginary little figure or created a little avatar, you are a gamer, okay? And the best part about it is that, um, you know, from my perspective with gaming, I got started way back in the day on the MMORPGs, the, multi, the mass multiplayer games, EverQuest, World of Warcraft. Um, I then moved into Counter-Strike, which is a sort of a first-person shooter team-based game. Uh, got into Magic and started playing Magic, the, the, not the um, video version, but the, the, hard, the paper version. And then, of course, there was poker, too. Uh, these are all, when it boils down to it, all these games are very analytical. They're very analytical. They're very logical. That is why when you have experience as a gamer and you want to go into product management, it's a great combo because I would say a heavy majority of the stuff that I did when I was a product manager is very succinct to, okay, well, I need to get this feature built from this person. I need to sign off. So if I do this, they're going to do this or this. Okay, cool. So if they do this, then I'm going to do either this or this. And I'll map this all out in my head like a chess game, trying to see how do I get to where I want to be? How do I get what I want? Because as product managers, all we care about is the customer and the product. We will go through heaven and hell to make sure that we have the best quality to deliver the best experience to our customers. And part of that means sometimes we have to play games. Um, in looking at the evolution of gaming though, and, I'm for, and I'll be upfront, I'm 42. Uh, like I said, I'm from Boston. Sometimes there's no filter between here and here, okay? So I'm very blunt, I'm very open about things. But being older, um, I started off with the original Nintendo. And I got hooked, and ever since then, it went right through through college. Um, I don't even want to imagine the amount of either guest lecturers or famous people that I missed when I was in college because I was sitting at my dorm room, click, 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 trying to kill that end boss for like the 12th time. Um, but looking at where we've come from gaming, from the Nintendo first to now Xbox, whatever, Steam, mobile, all the different platforms you can play on, you can play anywhere now. This is a game that you can be on a bus going to work, you can be in your bedroom, you can be at a hotel, you can get online and play a game and interact with someone else and challenge yourself to compete. But what that means though is that the system is getting huge now. Okay, the gaming industry is getting huge. 905 million revenue last year just on games. So all those times when you were growing up and your parents were like, get off the, get off the whatever, you're never gonna make money doing that, bull crap. <laughs> okay, because I got another number that's gonna blow your mind in a minute. And to make things even, you know, even funnier, this is up 38% from the year before. So you find me another growing industry that's growing close to 40% year over year, monetarily, and that's an opportunity. That's an opportunity for everyone in here because Seattle is a hotbed for gaming. It's volatile, it's, I mean, it, you know, it, can, it can flux, but it's aggressive. And I mean, this is the place that you wanna be doing, especially with that much money on the table. But when we look at the two sides of gaming, you know, we talk about the console side, we talk about the multiplayer games, we talk about MMORPGs, and these sort of evolved. They started from like the desktop to the web to your phone, and, uh, and, and that would be like the EverQuest to Farmville, ironic I put that in there, uh, and Clash Royale you know, type games. So there was this evolution of you're playing versus a computer versus you might play versus a computer or somebody else, to now you're playing against 12 year olds and they're killing you, okay? Within a 10 year period though, the gaming sector has gone from being, to one of, being one of the smallest to being the largest segment grower in that 10 year span. Meaning that there's no other industry that has grown in volume, revenue, and in employment than the gaming industry over the last 10 years. Now on the flip side of the coin, this is where we're talking about esports now. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was younger and I used to play video games, and actually, you know what? My girlfriend will tell you I still do this. I'll be playing a video game, Madden or something. Oh, watch this, watch this, you know, I'm gonna do this really good. And then she would say, you know, I don't care. Well, that's why we have Twitch. That's why we have different avenues now, mediums of communication to not only showcase what we're doing, but to share that and monetize it as well. Those are great things because now when we move into esports, we're talking about taking the NFL mentality of, of production, of excitement, of competitiveness and prize money to boot, 
and putting that in a medium where everyone can view it, buy tickets for it, um, and treat it like a real sport. The, the funny part is, though, is that you would think that from an esports perspective, it would be esports companies putting money into the game. You would think that it would be like, uh, like Riot, League of Legends, or uh, Hearthstone, or things like that. No, it's actually all third-party money. My very last conversation I had at Wizards before I left was, was um, with a professional sports team that was wanting to talk to us about possibly partnering with us because they had already invested $35 million in their esports, their own esports league. And I was like, man, this is absolutely bonkers. This sport has nothing to do... The games they were offering, they were just sponsoring standard games like League and uh, CS and, and Dota and all those things. They weren't even sponsoring like, K and, like NBA K2 or any like sports games. That's what made it even crazier. Um, but as these opportunities grew and advanced, it was amazing just to see the growth in that esports sector. 137 billion dollars in 2018 was spent on digital, online, and mobile games. Now, I know for a fact I'm good for 10 bucks out of this 137 billion because I candy crushed a few times and bought extra lives. But this is talking about the console games. It's talking about every single type of game we talked about. 137 billion dollars. There is some companies that are just getting filthy rich right now. And they're growing and they're hiring. And what they need is they need so awesome, blah, solid, awesome product managers. Because without them, there is no one minding the ship. You will have the incorrect people guiding the, the product and guiding the future of that product. And there's a very good reason why that is. When you look at product management and you look at um, how it fits into gaming, so I'll ask, I asked who was gamers, I asked who was gamers earlier, but who, who would be interested in looking at a product management gig in the gaming space? And that's fine. The reason why though is that because when you do, you gotta be very, very aware of what you're doing. This isn't Amazon where you could be working on like a Kindle one week and then something else another week. It's not, um, you know, it's not Boeing where we're working on, you know, in the aerospace field. So it's like, you have to ask yourself, why do you want to get into gaming? What is your goal? You know, are you hoping just to like, wear, you know, not have to get dressed for work anymore and just, you know, go in there and, you know, do all sort of cool stuff? That's fine, but there's got to be a good reason for it. You know, what are you hoping to do? Are you hoping just to be a fan? Are you, are you going to work at this company because you've played their games forever and it's a great thing? Um, you know, what working in gaming is. What I mean by this bullet point here is what working in gaming is, is it is a job. It is a real job with real business, real money, real people. It is not the stereotype that you might see online or in movies where people are just like, you know, ah, this isn't Silicon Valley from HBO, okay? We have no Guilfoy, all right? But the, what working in the gaming is not, okay, it's not a pass just to, to skimp on quality. It's not an opportunity for you to try and um, change things that you like about games just because you like them. You, I mean, essentially, and this is going to sound brutal, and I'm sorry, but when you go to work in the gaming industry, you don't matter anymore. The reason why is because you are not building for your experience. You are building for the customer's experience, and you're no longer a customer. You are now steering that ship and making sure that the person who is taking that train from SeaTac into downtown Seattle is having the best possible morning because of the game that you're helping manage. So when we look at this and we say, how do you get your foot in the door? Because I know a lot of people who have tried to get into gaming and they always say the same thing, you know, who do you know? Like, how do you get there? Like it's, I applied and I never heard anything. Well, this isn't a mom and pop industry anymore, okay? This isn't someone just getting emails and picking some to look at for resumes and some not. They have HR departments now. They have the same scanners that every other company does. So to get through those, you have to do the same thing that you would do for an Amazon, a Google, a Facebook. You have, to, you, have to, you have to trim the resume, you have to look at the job description, you have to curate it and make it special for that. Um, but the same, the same tips apply. LinkedIn, 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 LinkedIn. I can't stress it enough. The reason why is because you need to be able to form bonds with people. If you're trying to get an inside track on someone else, there's someone over there who's just filling out application after application and praying, okay? Then there's someone else who's on LinkedIn and active, 
and being a little sneaky, okay? And, I, and I'll show you with what I do and what I've done before. Um, I will find, I'll do a search in, in I'll do a search in uh, LinkedIn and, and look for the title. So when I was, um, I would type in like for, the, for Wizards, for instance, Wizards of the Coast, and then I would put in something like producer, product manager, recruiter, HR, whatever, some titles in there. So I would find a list of people and then I would see what groups they were in and then I'd get involved in those groups. And then what I would do is I would start interacting with those people to be able to be like, you know, like, oh, that's a great post. Yeah, that's a great post. You know, and I'm coming in on the side. And, it's, and I'm, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like saying, like, yo, that's a great post. And by the way, I'm, uh, are you hiring? No, I'm not doing it that way. I'm just forming a bond in conversation because now, eventually, I can, friend, I can LinkedIn connect with that person. And they're going to go, oh, yeah, that's, that's the person who was being cool with me on that thing. Okay, and then now you're connected. And then met a quick message, oh, you know, hey, thanks for, thanks for linking up. You know, we'll get to know each other or whatever. And just leave it at that because then they'll contact you back because now they think that you don't want something from them, but you do. And that's okay because you're being strategic. You're using your gaming instincts on how are you gonna get, how are you gonna win the game, okay? Um, don't stalk people. Don't start following them on Instagram and, and you're showing up where they are. Oh, hi, I happen to be here. No, don't do that. I'm just saying for LinkedIn, it's a great networking event. Um, gaming events, open houses. A lot of times, Microsoft, Amazon, they'll throw these open expos um, where they'll show off, you know, their studios, they'll show off new games. You have to, LinkedIn's a good place to find out where those are. You have to also, you have to hunt around for them a little bit. They're a great, great um, place to go, if anything, just to meet people. Um, when I went to Microsoft's for their Xbox uh, team, I got a, um, an offer, or not an offer, but an interview with their Azure team. And I, my cloud skills were a little iffy, so I was like, you know, well, but I kept in touch with, with, the, with the person who was, who was there. Super cool person, and now we trade. I'm like, I need, I'm like, I need a product manager so bad. Oh, I have a couple of candidates I know that I can hook you up, and we, and we, and we, we trade, you know, we, we talk, and we go back and forth. Um, it's, it's helping each other, because we're all in the same community. We all want to do the best. We want this, uh, this discipline to be one of the most respected ones out there. And so we do that, we have to work together. Career websites, duh. I mean, your typicals, a lot of these companies are gonna post on there. A lot of, a lot of these gaming companies will third party their, um, job their job postings. So they'll have a company that's out there posting them on some of the bigger sites. Um, I would definitely not just look at them and say, oh, that's not real. It's definitely real. Uh, most of the times, the, the smaller studios that are growing, that have maybe two or 300 people in them, um, those are the ones that are going to probably use that sort of service. Uh, so definitely check the career websites. But the one thing to remember and get your foot in the door is that they want talent. They don't want fans. They have enough fans. These games have millions and millions of players. They don't need someone coming in and talking about their high score and how amazing it is. They need to go in there and talk about why they are the best person to deliver the products they need to do. So the door is open, but now the interview. Um, really, just treat it like any other interview. Don't, get, don't do what I did and get so jacked up that you're like actually interviewing for a job in gaming. I mean, for me, working at Wizards and having played it for six years, um, I mean, played it uh, professionally for 10 years, but working there for six years, I went into my interview like more excited to show how much I knew about magic than actually talking about product management. And I could have, I could have messed myself up really bad that day. Um, remember the basics. When they're asking questions, you know, state your problems, state the action that you took, state the results, show the efficiency, show the, show the KPIs, okay? Don't let your knowledge of the, of the, let your domain knowledge of the game show or let your domain knowledge of gaming show, but don't let your passion show. And that's gonna sound weird because passion's a really important part of product management. So I'm gonna explain what that means. When I say don't show your passion, that's sort of what I was referring to about your high score. A lot of these people who work in some of these gaming companies, some of them don't even play games. You could be interviewing someone who just, doesn't, who just loves Python and is like, yep, I'm just Mr. Python, but I'm not going to know anything about this game. And so you're talking about, oh yeah, you know that level 42, I did this thing and that, 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 and you go, like, what? What are you talking about? I don't know. I wanna talk about product management. I wanna talk about how you are gonna take this idea and turn it into $50 million. 
Final thought before walking in that door and you're wondering why the heck is Ronald McDonald on this screen? And this is what I like to tell people about remember, remember McDonald's, okay? When I was in high school, I was a wrestler, I played football, and I would routinely consume close to like two Big Macs, 40 nuggets a day, and it was like, this is great. Going to school in the morning, I'll grab two, you know, Egg McMuffins. Um, it was great being young with a high metabolism. But when I was 16, I also got a job working at McDonald's. And if you go in there for after six months of coming home smelling like a French fry and an apple pie, you know, had a kid, that is, I never wanted to eat McDonald's again. Disgusted with it. So be really sure that before you get into gaming, you are ready to know that you might not like games afterwards. Or if you're going to work for a company with a game you like, you might not like that game afterwards. I will tell you myself, I do not play Magic anymore. And it's not because, you know, it has nothing to do with the company, has nothing to do with the game itself. It has to do that for six years, I went in and we did, made discussions about uh, decisions on everything down to a font size, to a game feature, to an integration. And after that, I said, man, I, just, I, no, I don't even want to go to the other side anymore. I'll just I'll play, I'll play Farmville, I guess. I'll, if Brian can hook me up with the link, I'll play Farmville. <laughs> so remember McDonald's. So you get your foot in the door, you've done the interview, and you actually get an offer. And this is great because the one thing I will give the gaming industry is that it is, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna phrase this a little differently because this could rub some people the wrong way. Um, but we'll, I'll do that at least 10 times in this presentation, so don't worry about it. Um, the gaming industry is a very accepting and very open industry. Uh, it's one of the most, and speaking from Wizards directly, one of the reasons why I played Magic for so many years was because Magic the Gathering was um, a game on a Friday night where you could see 50 people come together in a game store, all from different cliques in a school. So you'd see like a couple of jocks, you'd see a couple of buh, a couple of B, a couple of C, whatever, you know. But they would all come together for these four hours, and for those four hours, we were all Magic players. And we all, we all talked about the game and we talked about the new stuff that was coming. Now, yeah, granted, you know, go out the door at, you know, Friday night, everything goes back to the way it was, but it was a welcoming community. And the companies that work in that space are also very forward thinking, very welcoming because they understand who made those games popular. It was very tough for me when I was in high school to tell people that I played Magic because I used to get joked on. I used to get, you know, oh, you're going to play with your cards tonight? Yeah, so? Oh, I was just checking, you know, and that's fine. It's okay. But the thing is now we've gone past that. And these companies are, uh, they are, they want passion. They want talent and they also want to be successful. So if you have those three drives, those three values embodied and personified in your daily, you know, daily day to day stuff, you're going to do good with it. Now, once your foot is in the door though, remember now you are on the dark side now. You are now part of the evil empire. You are making the game. You are no longer the consumer of the game. Yeah, you may still play it when you go home or whatever like that, but you need to look at this from a totally different lens now. And when you get into this new position, you've got to network right away. The gaming verticals are extremely competitive inside the companies. The reason why is because, and I'm gonna, this is my opinion, camera, this is my opinion only, <laughs> is that there is so much ego in the gaming industry from people who work in the gaming industry. Um, I mean, you think that developers have big egos and, and they're prideful about what they do? Oh, you go to a gaming company and check it out from there. It's times 10. Because everyone thinks they've got the answer to the next big thing. Their code is the best. Their, you know, their, their runtime is the absolute greatest. They, they, it's, it's all competitiveness. But with these companies that are growing, people are thinking, okay, we're at 80 people in this company right now. We have a new game launching this year, one launching next year. We may see a round of Series C funding. That's going to be about maybe 14 million based off like a $100 million valuation. Okay, that means we're going to hire like 80 more people, which means there's going to be leadership positions opening up next year. I can see down the road on that. I want that position. So I'm going to make sure that my, you know, uh, I almost said something really bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure my face is pretty. That's a good way to put it. I'm gonna make sure my house is in order. I'm gonna make sure they know who I am, that I'm doing the best stuff. And if that means maybe not helping another teammate so I can get ahead, that happens. Is it cool? Hell no. 
Is it unethical? Oh, yes. But it's part of the game, how it's played, and I've seen it. Um, this last part, I talked about this in my last presentation uh, when I was here. And so when you join a gaming company, you are now a level one noob. You are a level one newbie, and you've got a ton of hit points. And what that means is, for those of you that haven't played games with hit points, it's essentially you're a warrior, you've got a lot of armor, you can take a lot of hits. The reason why um, I, I mention that is because one of my favorite things that I like to do with new companies is called newbie credits. And what newbie credits are is that you're a new company, you don't know everything yet, and you have a lot of credit to make mistakes. Which means that if you um, want to go forth and be like, oh, well, I'll give you an example. At one of my, one of my recent jobs, I, had a, um, I was there maybe a week, and one of my teammates asked me, you know, hey, we want to do X, Y, and Z. And so I said, okay, done. So I went and did it, made the right moves, moved people around. And then about like an hour later, I got an email that was like, you know, you know, Tony, we're not supposed to do things like that. There's forms that we need to fill out and there's approvals that need to be signed off on for it. So of course I was like, oh, I didn't know I'm new. Oh, it's okay. You'll learn as you be here for a while. It's six months. I'm still occasionally, sometimes I even still use the credits now. I'm like, you know, oh, I've only been here six months. I, I don't know what's going to happen after six years. That excuse is not going to fly anymore. Like, I've only been here six years. I'm sorry. I can't. I, I did that again. Um, but, but you do get these newbie credits when you work in a new, in a new uh, product management position. So it gives you the opportunity to make some mistakes. It gives you the opportunity to be bold um, and then play, play the card to be like, oh, sorry, I didn't know. Um, but it also will help you uh, just establish your presence, which is actually the most important part. That leads into the networking. Quick wins. Find some quick wins early in this gaming space. Uh, there's, it's intense. There's pressure from both sides, from development and the business. And you need to be aware of where your quick wins are going to be. Is it volunteering to help someone else with something so you can you know, get attached to it? Is it... Um, trying to you know, suggest a different way of doing things that doesn't impact the delivery, but in fact makes it better. Um, you have to look for those, for those low-hanging fruit quick wins because as soon as you establish that, you're, that you deliver, that you're a closer, that you're a winner like that, you're going to get more credit down the road. And I would, never, I would never tell a new person at a company to burn through all your newbie credit because I've done that and it's horrible because then you've got to get more credit. Um, by getting these quick wins, you start building a portfolio of good reputation. And your words and your decisions as a product manager are only going to be as good as your reputation. If you're known as a, blow, a blowhard that just always talks and never delivers, it doesn't matter if you get up there and speak like, you're, like you've done it for a million years, no one's going to believe you. But if you're the person who gets it done no matter what, breaks through the walls and makes it happen, it doesn't matter what you say, your actions are going to speak far louder. And that's what's going to actually deliver the best product possible. So unique challenges in gaming. This is interesting because um, I was going to use some, some examples from, from Wizards, but instead I was going to, I'm going to use some other examples from other friends in the gaming industry. And the reason why is because there's similarities. A lot of times in the gaming industries, you have two types of gaming companies. You have the ones that started off for gamers by gamers. And what happens is usually that company will grow. And at some point, those VPs or the founders, they end up taking different roles because they have to bring in people who actually have experience in global marketing or global distribution or package art or tax laws or all that sort of stuff. So when you get to a new company, your business partners, the people that you are asking you for what they want, they might not understand your world. The gaming world is very unique. The gaming world is um, one where we have our own language sometimes, it sounds like. Um, in Magic, we had our own set of, of like buzzwords that we just used with each other, not like we planned it. It was just like the vernacular of the gaming community. And, but if you were outside of our community and you listened to us, we sounded like idiots. It was hilarious. And that's one of the things that, in the same idea, when you're working with the business, with marketing and sales and all these other departments, they're not going to understand the, the funny little inside jokes about the games. They're not going to understand the buzzwords. They're not going to understand. What they want to understand is the data that, from the players that tells them what's the best direction to go. So if you're still ingrained in those communities, get that data. Know where to find it. Know who to talk to. 
and be able to pull that in to be like, look, it's not just me who wants to be able to do X, Y, Z. All of these other people want to do it as well. We are your audience. And that's the way you have to look at it. Your business partners aren't going to know everything. Same thing for the developers too. You can write the best code in the world and you may not even know how to play a game. And granted, it, it helps if you're in the gaming space and, you've, and, you've, and you're a coder because then you're able to use what you know about the games and be able to put that into code at some point or put that into UX or however you're doing it. Um, but again, just remember, not everyone at a game company is a gamer. Some people, it's just a job. Not everyone's going to be a fan. So when I started off at Wizards, it was interesting because I was so stoked to be there. I mean, if I had, if I, had I would have shown up with my Wizards t-shirt, my Wizards sweatpants, my Wizards hat, backpack, little lunchbox. And like, Look at me, I'm at Wizards, everyone. I'd be posting on Instagram, Facebook. And, oh, well, sorry, I can't go. I have to go to Wizards for my job, you know, and just let everyone know. Um, but other people would show up to work and just be like, you know, my kid's got a baseball game at four. Can I go home? You know, they're not, they're not like super stoked about the game. So, no, you know, you got to remember, there's people there who aren't there because it's a gaming company. They're there because it's a company. Um, you have a job, you have a mission, and we've covered what that is. It's delivering the best for the customers, delighting their experience, which in turn makes money, more jobs, and great things for you because you'll be up the ladder. But stay your lane. Remember, you're there to do a job first. You're not there to go swing by R&D and see what's going on. You're not there to go offer to help um, test new games you know, every single day when you have like, you know, an hour break. Um, you're not there to find out what the new secret stuff is so you can tell your friends. You have a product. Your job is to make that product amazing and to do it by any means necessary. Stay your lane. If you get offered, sure. When I was at Wizards, because I had played uh, professionally before, they had asked me, hey, do you want to come down like, you know, and help us test new Magic cards? And um, it's, it was called the Future League. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, I should have said this earlier, I apologize, who doesn't know what Magic is, essentially, if, and since I don't work there anymore, I can say this because they, they hate this reference. If you took poker and chess, made it into a card game, added a bunch of dragons, and made it extremely skill-based, that's Magic. Um, and so I would go down there and help test these new cards that would get released. But it was like, it was, you know, for an hour or two a month. And it was cool. But then there was like someone else who worked at Wizards who was just on the fan, the fan train. And every single thing that was there, person was going to be there. Oh, I get it. This person's goal was to work in, in research and development. Um, fantastic coder. Wanted to, work and be, wanted to work nothing but magic every day, all day. Uh, and eventually didn't work out because the passion wasn't there for being a product manager. The passion was there for being a fan of the game. And they don't mix. Also, look at the kind of company you're going to. Are you a technology company or a gaming company that's learning technology? Okay? And there's a difference and it matters. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I said that with so much passion. Like, it matters. The uh, reason why is because there's a company that was here in Seattle, um, and they got bought out by King Games, the company that did Candy Crush. And then that company, Candy Crush, got bought out by Activision Blizzard. Um, they were a gaming company. Pretty good one, too. They know gaming. They know the gaming mechanisms, programming, whole nine yards. Okay? Now take Wizards. Okay? Wizards was a, a, a tangible product game. It was a card game, okay? Dungeons and Dragons, all books and manuals and things like that. It wasn't until, I would say, you know, maybe the 2000s that they started dipping their toes into the online video game space with, with um, uh, Magic Online, and now the new version is, is Magic Arena. But there was a huge learning curve because Hasbro had just recently bought out Wizards of the Coast that time. They'd gotten into video games now, but they had no experience in it. They were a physical company making digital games versus being a company that was founded to make games. You see the difference there? And it's important because you got to know before you go in what you're getting into. When I started at Wizards, I, met, you know, I, I was flown out for an interview. And I met with um, the CTO, the VP, and who would be my director. 
And I had said, you know, so I'm like, what are you guys, you know, are you guys using Agile? Are you guys using Scrum? Like, what are you, like, what are you doing for your, you know, processes? Oh, yeah, we're an Agile company. And when I got there, it was not, just, just saying that you're having a stand-up does not make you an Agile company. Okay. And um, I'm very pleased to say that since I started at Wizards to where they are now, um, they, have, they've, they are now a pretty efficient um, agile, agile shop over there. They've made leaps and bounds in terms of some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, but at many other companies, it's the same thing. Boeing even is the same thing. We're an aerospace company. I mean, we build the best planes in the world, but we're not known for our games. Or, I mean, I have our games. Uh, we're not known for, like, you know, uh, we don't sell software. You know, things like that. We don't sell, like, Microsoft Word or anything like that. So keep that in mind. Being the peacekeeper. Now, in product management, one of the biggest things that we do on a daily basis is we deal with temperamental people, whether it's business or engineers or whatever. Someone is going to give you attitude at least once, to, once or twice a day. In my case, five or six. Um, and so you got to assume that you're going to be brokering a lot of peace meetings between the business that's going to say, we want everything and a cherry on top. And the developers are going to say, well, that's going to take about 76 years. One of the biggest conflicts I see in, in product management and gaming is that you have to be able to set one rule down right away. You either get to pick what you want or you get to pick when you get it. You don't get to pick both. Doesn't happen. Because the minute you give the power to the business to be able to make that decision, and also when it's due, you are effectively telling your development team, I don't care about you. Now, that also means that as product managers, we have to have that extra chip on our shoulder that we can go in to any person's office and tell them no. I will, I will do that every night of the week, and I've told my team this at Boeing too. I said, if you can't go into our VP's office and tell him, tell him no to his face and, and stick to your guns and tell him why we're saying no, this might not be the right job for you. There might be better ones out there. There might be you know, maybe some skill training that we can get to help with that, but you got to have the ability to say no because otherwise the business will run you ragged. That was one of the biggest challenges that I faced at Wizards. Is we had a very, very smart very aggressive business side of the office. My boss was um, a VP of marketing, his name was Jerome. One of, I mean, he's probably one of, one of my best bosses ever. The, Jerome would have your back. If you're on his team, Jerome would have your back. And that's where I think I learned a lot of mine uh, over the years of how to get my teams back, because Jerome always had, had my back even if I was wrong sometimes. Um, but there was a lot of times where we had to push back some very eager expectations. And one rule that I had with my teams is that I never, ever commit for them. So when someone say to me, well, we want to get this release out here instead of here on the roadmap. Oh, that's great. So good, we're going to do it? Nope. Well, why not? Because I don't make that decision. My job is to explain to the team very clearly what we're doing, and then I will accept their commitment. Oh, well, we don't have time for that. Well, I'm sorry, but you said that we're an agile shop. And if you're not embracing the agile values, respect, openness, commitment, then you're just talking. The business cares about the money. I hate to, I, I'm not trying to paint the business side of things as being cold and, you know, calculated and everything. But if you're in like, say, marketing, your job is to market a product. Your products are measured by how successful they do in those markets. If you're not making money off those products, then you're not doing a good job at marketing. So that's why the business cares about money. Now, development, I think, cares more about the experience and the quality. Um, my son is a fantastic musician. I can say that because I'm his dad. And he, uh, but music is another kind of art, an art, version of art that I cannot even comprehend or do. But from the coding side of things, that's another kind of art. And when I was a coder, I used to make beautiful, I used to love that experience of just seeing all these random things and all of a sudden run it and it's like, oh my God, this is great. I did this. I couldn't believe it. Like when I pushed my first app live, I saw it on the Apple store and I was like, I was 14 years old again. I was like, hee 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 hee, this is amazing. So you have to think about it in terms of like you're balancing that, that measuring stick between the two worlds. Um, 
also get all the voices to, tab to the table before it becomes complicated. And I'll tell you what that means. A lot of the times in a lot of gaming companies, you're moving quick, you're thinking quick, and a lot of hallway conversations go on. A lot of drive-bys go, go on where it's like, you know, hey, are we going to be good for Friday? Yep, all right, cool. And then I'm off to something else. Now, someone else is coming from that direction and saying, oh, you know, are we going to be good for this on Friday morning? Person on the, yeah, sure. Now this person's double booked. They don't even want to come to work on Friday now. We have no paper trail about who asked first. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And so what I would always make sure to do is that when some, one of those things would happen, one of those drive-bys would occur, and, and I mean drive-by, not drive-by, drive-by, um, is that I would be like, look, we need to get the SMEs at the table. We need to get the people at doing the work at the table. And like, oh, well, we don't want to have another meeting. I would rather spend 20 minutes with the people at the table and at least hearing the same things, hearing the same vernacular, being able to ask questions about uh, specifics and making sure we're using common language so a proper commitment can be made. I would much rather do that than get halfway through a sprint, find out it's all crap, and then have to kill the sprint, start over, and go back to scratch. Now, I, I broke one of my own rules there, and I said, well, have a meeting. Because me personally, I detest meetings. I think that most of the time it's people who just want to hear themselves talk. Um, I've, I've played games sometimes in previous jobs many, many years ago, the recording, um, where I would just sometimes use big words and just see who bought into them. Because I wanted to see who was really paying attention, who cared about the product. I wasn't trying to clown anyone and embarrass them. I was literally doing a litmus test to see how much attention they're paying to the product and where that passion lies. Because if I'm feeding them straight BS and they're saying great, that means that I wasn't doing my job making sure the business is well informed about what was going on. It, mean that I, it meant that I was doing a poor job. And I had to rectify that. So you, had to be, you always just got to keep that up and you know, keep that in your mind. Um, get those voices to the table. Make sure people are heard. Make sure they're being respected. Because if you're going to drop the hammer on someone because something didn't get done off of a commitment, then you've got to make sure that respect was there in the first place. You can't just turn it on when you want to. You can't just be convenient with it. You've got to be steady with it. You've got to stick to it. And that's the last line here in terms of using a process. If your team is using Scrum, Agile, Waterfall, I don't care. I don't care what you... I'm not, gonna, I'm not here advoca advocating or evangelizing one process or another. No way. But what I'm saying is that if you're using a process, stick to it. Stick to the fundamentals. Stick to what the book says. Stick to what your team has done. The minute you let someone come in and put their hand in and start making it okay to skip stand up or to combine your retro with the next one or whatever it is. Okay, the minute you allow that to happen as a product manager, you have lost control of your team. You have lost control of your product. Because now you're making you're justifying excuses to skimp on quality. And if you're not getting effective information out of your retrospectives, if you're not having a daily stand-up and being able to communicate, if your whole team can't communicate about what's going on with your product at that very moment, then that's an issue. And that's not something that you're going to fix by just making it more blasé and more easy. You have to drop the hammer sometimes, but you, at, the, at the base of it, you got to stick to it. And if they try and make you change it, push back. Otherwise, you are not a strong team. And that's the only way that you're going to be an effective product manager, and it's the only way that your team is going to deliver greatness. Realities of the gaming industry. I hate talking about this, but my, my mandate here tonight is to tell you the truth. You already know I'm blunt, maybe obnoxious, that's fine, that's fine. Um, but in the gaming industry, sometimes you're only as good as your last game. A lot of these companies are fragile. And it's not because they're bad companies. It's because they have different models. If you're a company with, say, let's say we form a company right here, okay? We put out a game, get up to, you know, make a quick 80 mil. Sounds good. Let's make another game. So now we get another group of people that come in. We get salaries, and there's insurance, and then there's liability. Now we need more office space. Everyone wants new Macs. Da, 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 keep going on and on and on. Now you've burned through most of that profit already because you're investing in the company. Now you release your second game and it's awful. Tanks, dies, stinks. 
Now, how are you going to be paying the 160 people you have versus the 80 you had when you were safer? Some companies work like that because when it pays off, now they're like three, 400 people and they're cranking out three games a year or something. You know, that, I mean, that's, it's definitely an aggressive way of doing it. I don't look down on it. I'm just saying that's the way it works. Um, like I said before, gaming is fun. It's a relaxed atmosphere. You probably do more than you would in like a, a you know, a insurance company or something. I don't know. I hate naming names because I, I tend to do that. And I'm like, oh, I can't do that. He's recording. But um, just remember, you have a product to deliver. Gaming, game, gaming companies are fun to work for. There is more relaxation. Um, there is more opportunities to do some cool stuff. But you know what? That, that, that's in a lot of companies nowadays. I worked at Wizards for six years, and when I interviewed at Google, I would have left with a food bar at Google in a heartbeat. That thing was amazing. Um, avoid getting jaded and taking criticism personally. Reflect within. Now, I know that sounds all like, you know, yoga-y type, spiritual. No, no, that's not me. But I'm saying is that you are going to make decisions, and there's, if your game has got a huge audience, you are going to get people ripping you apart for something as stupid as, a font change or a one word text. Something so minute that you never thought about that was gonna be a big deal is there's gonna be someone in Arkansas who's got like, you know, 75,000 Twitter followers and like, you know, ah, oh, Tony wrecked this. And then next thing you know, your name is, your phone's buzzing every six minutes because they found your Twitter profile and now you're getting destroyed. Um, you can't take it personally, okay? You, if you're a gamer, and you're going into the gaming space, you need to, and when I say reflect within, you need to think about how you used to act, okay? I did that, and it cost me about 18 hours of scrubbing Twitter and other social media sites because I was one of those obnoxious people. I was the one who was sitting on the sidelines yelling at the company, you don't care about us, you don't, you don't, you're not good at what you do, what are you, guys, what are you idiots doing over there? And then when I got to the other side of the coin, um, I said, man, yeah, what am I doing over here? This is, this is weird now because I was taking the heat on the other side. Um, you just gotta understand that people are passionate. They love their games. It's what makes them happy. And if you're, if you're infuriating people, in a way you're doing a good thing because you know that people are paying attention to your game. You know that you're giving, they're giving you an opportunity to make it right. And if you do that, you will um, earn a lot of credit as being caring for the customer. Now, not everything you can change that they hate. Sometimes you do it for business decision, but it's important to always keep on top of that. Last thing is keep on top of trends. They change way faster than you think. Um, like I said, I was a programmer for about eight years. Uh, I worked in uh, Perl, PHP, um, some uh, command line languages. And when I moved into management and moved into the product side, I had stopped programming. And we would start talking about different ways of inter, you know, integrating certain services or integrating, building certain um, portfolios or whatever. And I'd be talking about like, oh, we should try doing this. And that's like six years old. Like, oh, what are we doing now? And they, they would list some new framework that's being used. And I don't know what that is. But, I would, but me being me, oh yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's use that. Yeah, that's a much better idea. Um, so you gotta keep on top of that. That's why I got back about maybe two years ago, I started programming again. I started working in Python. Um, considering I'm working in the data analytics space now, it's very helpful, especially with machine learning. Um, I, can, where I can build apps, I can do stuff on the web. I taught my kids Python. Uh, so it's great now, because we have, I'm doing, the, I'm, you know, I'm doing the data analytics machine learning stuff as part of my learning. My son's using the Python SDK for mobile apps. My daughter's uh, working in the web framework, the Django. Uh, I mean, I just got to have like three more kids and we can have a testing team and then we got a company. Um, but keep on top of those trends, you know, look, look in terms of like, you know, even with blockchain now, there's a lot of blockchain, blockchain based games that are becoming very popular, especially not just, not just crypto, but the actual blockchain technology. There is other companies getting into the crypto space. I'm not touching that. I'm not even talking about that. I'm just talking about the blockchain technology.